what, what is interesting to me is, you know, I am very proud of what I've done. And uh, it boggles my mind that I have to defend uh, this system. I think it's the cleanest, least uh, patronage, uh, as patronage uh, uh, is defined system in the whole country. And it squares with what I said in the book, Politics. May I make a reference to that for a moment? Although we're going to give it to you. This is what I said. I said patronage is not illegal, and patronage does not necessarily corrupt. It is simply not the best way to run a government. The notion of patronage, meaning that you can give some jobs in government to people you know instead of only working off a lift list is, is a, an accepted notion. The real question is how many, which is what we've been talking about, and who gets them? Are the people who get them friends of your powerful friends? Are the people who get them people whose major interest in getting them is to find a way to rip off the city? Were preferences given to political reference candidates or not? No. You realize you're testifying not, under oath? Not that I know of. There was none. The credible testimony today has shown that there was a significant patronage component to hiring in the Koch administration. Uh, that component obviously involves staffing major ma mayoral agencies with people that the commissioners of those agencies didn't particularly want, at least in some cases. We are currently in the courts attempting to give people uh, the opportunities that they have earned through their years of experience, through their training, through taking an uh, unbiased, competitive civil service examination that measures what they know and get, does not give any credence to who they know. Patronage abuses inevitably lead to public corruption. Uh, I think when you look at the people who were caught up in this scandal, how city agencies were converted into racketeering enterprises, according to the charges by Giuliani and the conclusion of the jury in New Haven, is that when you start moving away from the civil service law and violating the merit selection system, you inevitably end up with people like Jeffrey Lindenauer as provisionals with big jobs and big salaries, creating conspiracies of corruption. Few people had ever heard of Jeffrey Lindenauer until Queens Borough President Donald Manis tried to commit suicide in January of 1986. As the provisionally appointed deputy director of PVB, Lindenauer admitted that he took bribes from collection agencies for himself and Donald Manis. Lindenauer is the best possible case study. He, in 1980, he was unemployed and unemployable. He had run a quack sex therapy cl clinic that had gone bankrupt. Uh, he couldn't get a job. Donald Manis went to Ed Koch and said, I need a favor make this guy a deputy commissioner. No test, no qualifications. He didn't know anything about transportation. He didn't know anything about collecting traffic tickets. He didn't know anything about management. But Koch and Manis made him the deputy commissioner of PVB and put him in place to be a bag man and a fixer. And that couldn't have happened if Ed Koch honored and respected the civil service law. As the PVB scandal widened, it exposed close Koch ally, Bronx Democratic Party boss Stanley Friedman. Friedman, along with Manis and Lindenauer, rigged the bidding to win a city contract for a handheld ticket computer that hadn't even been developed. Two years before this scheme was revealed, Koch was confronted with this conflict of interest by journalist Jim Smith. Oh, absolutely. You know, what we have uh, is what we have all the time. Uh, by uh, those uh, who would really uh, seek to malign and implicitly convey corruption. Right. That's exactly what that statement is intended uh, to do. The fact that it's Stanley Friedman, well, you know, it's so easy to libel people. And that's what I perceive uh, the implication of what you're saying, intended or otherwise. Stanley, that's supposed to conjure up what? 
What's it supposed to conjure up? He's elected. I don't know. Do you know of any criminality on his part? If you do, don't answer. If you do, rush to the DA. Because if you don't, how dare you say these terrible things about him? Friedman was later convicted and jailed, despite Koch's refusal to take the conflict of interest seriously. He never apologized to me personally. I heard that in a press conference after Stanley's conviction that he did say that he should have listened to me. Another scandal soon toppled Koch's commissioner of the Department of Transportation, Anthony Amoruso. This was followed by other resignations and firings of many of Koch's top appointments. As the scandal investigations widened, Koch found it necessary to defend himself, asserting in his book, Politics, that he ran New York without patronage. Patronage was best described by Mita Esposito when he retired as Brooklyn Democratic County Chairman in 84 and waxing philosophical decided to tell the reporters exactly how patronage had worked for him. He gave the following il illustration. In 1973, he had supported Abraham Beam for mayor, and immediately after Abe Beam had won the primary, Beam called him in and said, Meade, you have six commissionerships. It was by these rules that the game was played in the city of New York for many years. We've never done that. Ed Koch went to Meade Esposito's mother's house in September of 1977 and said, please back me for mayor. I will give you three commissionerships and the two who turned out to be Glideman, Turoff, and Amoruso. And Turoff and Amoruso are now co convicted felons. In the case of Donald Manners, Koch knew. In the case of so many others, Koch had been told, Amoruso had been told. Koch knew. And generally, the people who blew the whistle were career civil servants who had decided that they could no longer sit still and allow this city to be robbed from under them. He appoints those commissioners and all of his advisors that he says he had no knowledge of these things that they've been involved in. To me, I think it is absolutely ludicrous that the people of New York City can hear him say that and actually not break out into uh, outrageous laughter. <laughs> And then he thinks it was right. He says, it's me. I did it. I worked. I sweated. As soon as they catch somebody, it's robbing the whole city. Who knew that guy? I never heard of him. Anymore. <laughs> he, has, he has a different opinion of every person depending on how they do it. If they're doing good, he nominated him. If they catch him, I never heard of him, that guy. <laughs> but, and he has a different opinion every day. Best Myers was the finest woman in the world for 25 years. Then they caught her. Said, she's the lowest bastard that ever lived. <laughs> Now they found her not guilty. I always loved Don Craig. <laughs> the civil service system was established in response to similar corruption scandals in New York City in the late 1800s. The notorious Tweed Ring of Tammany Hall used their control of City Hall to plunder New York's treasury. Patronage kept them in power. They bought votes and loyal party workers by doling out city jobs. To prevent such abuses, the centerpiece of the civil service system was objective testing to hire and promote permanent employees. I started working for the city in 1936 at the age of 19, during the LaGuardia years. And I went to work in the Department of Sanitation. And over the years, I took five promotion exams. What we used to do in those days was to study, 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 take an exam, wait for the list to come out, and then try to get promoted, to get the list moved. And then we would take another study routine. And so it went on uh, throughout the years, and that was the way that city employees advance themselves. That's the background, you see. Then it changed. According to former Labor Relations Director Russo, Wagner and Lindsay hired outside the civil service. Though this practice declined under a beam, the Koch administration devised ways to make it the principal method of hiring. How did they do it? One, by not giving exams. They had a lot of vacancies. So they would appoint provisionally. And they would appoint people from outside, uh, 
either to, to political organizations or friends or relatives, would come in and it would take jobs that would normally go to the rank and file through the promotion process. As a black, I know that the first time when I took a civil service exam and passed, I thought, boy, this is terrific. One, it meant that I had a job that had permanence, that had a future, I had an opportunity. My family thought this was great. My father thought this was wonderful, okay? It was a step up. In May of 1988, a little-known operation run out of the basement of City Hall, the mayor's talent bank, hit the headlines. Headed by Joe DiVincenzo, it was supposed to be an affirmative action program. Its staff received resumes, appropriately, in the old Tweed building behind City Hall. Uh, have a heart. I mean, you're in government. You work with uh, borough presidents. You work with county leaders. You, know, you work with city council members. You work with people uh, who elected you, who brought the troops out into the street to carry your petitions. And uh, you say to them, you can't get judges. I won't even listen to your uh, recommendation. You can't get anybody into the corporation uh, counsel's office. There are no jobs assigned to you. But I will take your resumes, and I'm going to be pilloried for that? I don't understand it. Once again, investigatory agencies took such charges more seriously than the mayor did. The New York State Commission on Government Integrity by, uh, began public hearings in January 1989. The commission was headed by Fordham University Law School Dean John Fierick. They heard evidence that the talent bank gave preferences to resumes from City Hall that were sponsored by powerful political leaders. Did you or anyone at DEP receive instructions to the effect that City Hall candidates were to be given preference? Yes. And where did those instructions come from? From City Hall. Do you know who at City Hall? Mr. DiVincenzo's office. Well, let's not talk theory. Let's talk what happened here. Okay. I was what assured happened? that... What happened? Tell me what happened when you had 40 qualified candidates. You were not going to send 40 over, and the computer wasn't going to make the random selection, notwithstanding whatever theory was going to be in place early years. Tell me what happened. How was the selection made? I can't, I can't tell you what happened. I wasn't there. I can tell you that the political people or the political source, as you refer to it, should not have been given a no, preference. No, 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 no. Don't slip away from the question. The testimony was that political referrals were made to the agencies, and that was the hot priority of the talent bank, was to get the political referrals out to the agencies. That was not my understanding how the talent bank was to be run. Although minorities were hired through the talent bank, they were in very low-level positions, and they were people who were recommended by political bosses. It had nothing to do with the civil service merit system. High-priority candidates were in red folders, and there was a green folder, which was for, quote-unquote, street resumes. When you say high-priority candidate or high-priority folder, what, what do you mean? I mean, those were the political candidates who were to be given more attention than all the other resumes. Any resume was just put in any folder? That's correct. Uh, actually, what happened, uh, they had no meaning at all. Uh, the clerks in the office were tired of filing in just the same drab manila folders. So in other words, there were red folders and green we folders? Had, we had every color under the sun. We had red, green, yellow, blue, orange purple and no one signified any hot referral or any political referral no several witnesses testified how DiVincenzo would hold up all other personnel action of the agencies until they hired the politically referred candidates from the talent bank the talent bank had an elaborate computer system it tracked how well agencies complied with city hall pressure to hire its politically referred candidates I never received anything that indicated that the political source was in the computer. I may have received a list which had a name on top and said, these are the candidates you asked about. I gave them the name and I gave them the source. The various people felt so guilty about their misuse of governmental power that they found that they needed to destroy the records when it happened that there was a 
a uh, Village Voice article, a newspaper article in New York City, concerning revelations about this patronage scheme. It seems that someone or some people were trying to obtain a warrant to come in to check the files, and they wanted to, to make sure that we would be prepared so that they wouldn't be able to find anything that would be incriminating. Uh, you testified that uh, Mr. DiVincenzo initiated this. What did he say? I don't recall his exact words. I think it was, uh, uh, you know, make, sh make sure that the talent bank doesn't have any referral sources in it. That material was being ripped into little pieces and thrown into giant lawn bags that had been brought into the office. The, the garbage uh, I knew was not going to be picked up the next day uh, at, uh, at 52 Chambers Street. And, and I didn't want, uh, because of the sensitivity of, uh, of the amount of stuff in the, uh, in the bags, I did not want uh, those papers to be flying all over Chambers Street the next morning. And you put it in your car. Where'd you put it in your car? Uh, I believe one in the trunk, one in the back seat. And what'd you do with it? I disposed of them at my house. I know nothing about the destruction of documents, as was testified yesterday. But I was under the assumption, and I was told by Jim Hine and the people that ran the talent bank, that we kept a current pool of candidates. I think that what we did, and this very modest uh, uh, patronage uh, uh, response. And patronage is another word for discretionary jobs. It depends on how you define the nature of the patronage. And I say uh, that when we've, we've excluded them, as I conveyed to you, and simply included them in this lowest level, I don't understand uh, why that should be uh, the subject uh, of criticism. Using the mayor's own definition of discretionary hires, during his tenure, patronage jobs increased from 14,000 to 56,000, according to personnel department records. 6,000 jobs that I could have filled. Mayor Koch told the commission he had no prior knowledge of the talent bank's patronage system and would not have approved of certain of its practices. Koch denied that the citywide increase of patronage jobs to 56,000 indicated a policy of deliberately avoiding civil service tests. And those people who are recommended by Manis, Friedman, Esposito, Biaggi, Simon, they were put in red folders, red hot recommendations. And all these folders were shredded, which was to me symbolic of what Ed Koch has done to the civil service law over 12 years. He has shredded that law, pa even packed the Civil Service Commission with cronies and hacks and not enforced that law, which is the, the best bulwark and protector of the civil service merit system. In the 1977 race for mayor, Koch promised that he, quote, will follow the law limiting retention of provisionals to nine months and will permanently fill competitive classified positions by examination. Just uh, two weeks after he entered into office, and we asked the mayor what his program would be to eliminate provisionals and reduce patronage. Well, with, with a just a clear voice and a blank face, he says, but I like provisionals. <laughs> We've had, uh, I would have to say, problems with this administration. The major one is the chief of department, the highest level that anyone could achieve through civil service testing. For over 20 years, the city and the fire department did not give an examination for that title. They have filled it with provisional people that they selected. Uh, we had to take a court action to force them to give an exam. The courts admonished the department and the city for ignoring state and city law by not giving that exam. So yes, that's a major problem for us. Another title, the engineers who, who go to school, get a degree, work hard, try to build this city, try to plan for the city, and they stay because they love to work for the city. What happens? The mayor makes a decision to reclassify certain titles above their titles and deny them opportunities to promote. But this patronage really is destroying the morale and costing the city millions of dollars because they're bringing people in who do not know the operation or have the ability 
to do the job. And that is why my people are very much disturbed, because they have to literally train and teach these people what it is that's necessary to be done. Many of them, in fact, most of them, do not even join the pension system, because they don't want to take the extra deduction out of their check. And they're not staying. The greatest deterrent in New York to corruption is the pension system. The, the uh, civil servants know that if they go, do get fired for corruption, they lose their pension. Well, this city couldn't operate without its yeah, career uh, professional yeah, civil know. servants. And it does become demoralizing if you get the sense that opportunity to advance based on your merit and your performance is foreclosed arbitrarily, that you aren't given the chance to compete, that people are brought in willy-nilly from the outside, even though there are people in-house who have worked their way up, who can do the job. One union whose mostly minority and female members proved they could do the job, but whose promotions were blocked by the city, is Local 1180 of the Communications Workers of America. Back in 1984, our local went to court in order to force the city of New York to hold an exam for the title uh, administrative manager, which is a civil service competitive title. Over 80 percent of the administrative managers were provisionals. The court ordered the city to hold an exam and to replace the provisionals forthwith. Almost 900 CWA members passed the test. Two-thirds of them still await promotion because the city reclassified some job titles and arbitrarily changed the criteria for others after the test results were published in 1987. You work for the city for 19 years, you've given them your best. You figure if you take a test, you can move up. And now they're saying all of a sudden, you can take a test, but now you're not qualified. I'm very angry because in two years, when I scored number three on the list, I haven't been promoted. I went down for an interview before a board of political appointees for jobs. And one of the people that, were interviewing, that was interviewing me was a political appointee. And he was interviewing for his job. And he passed me over so he could be appointed to that job because he had a lower number. CWA and other unions protested at City Hall and at personnel director Judith Levitt's office. They emphasized that city hiring practices crippled city services and hurt all New Yorkers. I started working for the city of New York as a young lady because I thought that was the place to be. I thought because I was black and a female, I stood best chances of working for the city and learning by my own wit taking a test, getting promotion. I didn't have to be a pet, I didn't have to be a friend, I didn't have to keep strange bedfellows. Just on the strength of myself and being a black woman and taking pride in being that, I thought working with the city I would have the progress that I deserved. But Judy Levitt with the stroke of a pen tells me I can't do that. I've been with the department for 15 years. I feel I've contributed a lot to the department. I can still contribute more. And I also feel that now that I have my time to vest with the city, it behooves me if I want to earn more money to go out and look for a job elsewhere, which I think is unfortunate to everybody concerned, myself and the department. I, I recognize that, that uh, the city set the rules. They said if you take these examinations and if you, you successfully uh, uh, pass, if you pass, that uh, the promotions will be available. And then to, to set requirements that, that uh, exclude people uh, requirements that seem designed to assist only those provisionals that have been in those spots is unfair. White America has said, well, we made our peace with the 60s, and we've had the 70s, and we'd like to coast. We'd like to believe that we can go back to the good old days when it was fashionable to believe that only whites could be managers, and only whites could be supervisors, and only whites could make policy. And that's not true. Not only is it not true, it is not good. We remember the days when the union movement had more than just the member in their extended family. We embraced the problems of the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the hopeless, the left out, and the left behind. Years ago, when that was the philosophy of union leaders, when those people who were left out and left behind 
joined the labor force, they willingly joined unions because they remembered when they were down and out, there was an institutional force that cared. The union movement, its membership skyrocketed during that period. We have never lost that commitment to a broader social agenda. To put an end to the patronage abuses seen in the last decade, many political and labor leaders call for the strengthening of the civil service system. I think that the merit system has its advantage. It's not perfect. A lot needs to be done. But uh, it's certainly a step forward from the kind of thing we were listening about, listening to today and uh, on Monday. When you have something which uh, corrupts uh, a talent bank system trying to do something in the area of affirmative action, uh, that can't help but trouble people who want to see a decent government. I think the focus on strengthening the civil service system lies with creating an independent civil service commission who has the authority then to appoint the personnel director not appointed by the mayor but appointed by an independent commission whose role it is to enforce the personnel rules and regulations and to ensure funding of the department of personnel by putting some sort of per capita payment to the department of personnel based on the, on the size of the city workforce so it, can, so it can maintain its personnel operation there has to be independence from City Hall, and there should be a monitoring uh, structure to make sure that the Department of Personnel, they're living up to the obligations. And there has to be uh, a strict adherence to the civil service rules. And they have to have more exams. The minute that there is a vacancy, or even before that, they should always have an exam. They should hold an exam. The employee should be given an opportunity to, to uh, prepare for the exam. They should have in-service training. They should have tuition and reimbursement so that this mass of workers should be given an opportunity to study and to learn. In the city, you've got to have that transition. You've got to have that avenue of promotion, which I, I benefited from and many of my colleagues did. That's gone now. In addition, Labor leaders offer these two proposals. One, allow workers who pass promotional exams to be eligible for promotion, not just in their own agency, but in any city agency. And two, make job classification policy a mandatory subject of collective bargaining. We need a mayor that will have an administration that would be supportive of the civil service system and what that means and of public employees rather than an adversarial relationship that does not inure to the benefit of the public. You have a city that hears about Jeffrey Lindenauer, that hears about the Parking Violations Bureau scandal, that is distressed about the sale of uh, fake taxi medallions. What do they say? They say city government is corrupt, city workers are corrupt, you can't trust any of those guys. And that negative image of government in the public's eye gets dumped back at the door of the longtime honest worker who is simply trying to do some public service, pay his or her living costs, and hopefully move up the employment ladder. If any mayor were to drop dead on the job and all his commissioners go down the tube, you couldn't tell the difference for the first six months. The people who run the city are the civil servants and they know how to run it. Everybody here who wants to be mayor, who would love to be mayor, who can't be the mayor, who hasn't got a job for mayor, everybody here decided, I think I'm going to be the mayor. I don't think there's one person here who doesn't think he could do a better job than Koch, and they're all right. <laughs> Koch's slogan was, after eight years of charisma and four years at the clubhouse, try confidence. I think he's given us 12 years at the clubhouse and charisma and no confidence. No matter what you ask him, he never heard it, he never saw it. And none of the corruption in the city is any of his business. Somebody would think all this time he was mayor of Philadelphia. <laughs> How many city mayors have had a bridge closed like Williamsburg? What was his response? Why didn't the commissioner do the job he was supposed to do? Well, they got rid of one commissioner. They have somebody there now, and the Department of Transportation is good, but he inherited a mess because of the political appointments being made because of the power brokers in the city of New York, like Manus, Friedman, who were basically influencing the mayor, and the mayor gave up his prerogative. 
That's what has to be told. The mayor is not following through on his responsibilities. Uh, he also um, clearly is the person that's best capable of setting an ethical and moral tone uh, as to how city government is going to be run. Uh, and this mayor has not done that. The question is, is he the mayor of the city? And if he is, he's responsible for the city. And if he's responsible, he should be responsible enough to feel obligated to answer these accusations. You don't have to be in a court of law to feel obligated to answer these accusations. All New Yorkers should be concerned with civil service reform because patronage and corruption inevitably disrupt services for everybody. The merit system is not there just to protect city workers. It is there to protect the integrity of the government. It is there to make sure that in a democratic society, any one of us, anywhere, if they have the skill, if they have the talent, if they have the ability, they can get a job based on what they know and not who they know. That all workers in New York City, unionized and desiring to be unionized, are entitled to dignity, justice, and respect. That we, as citizens of the city, demand that our government treat us with dignity, justice, and respect. Thank you, and Godspeed.